Hello genealogists, it's Craig again with Just Genealogy. And this is Becoming a Professional Genealogist, our usual Saturday shtick. So today we're going to talk about the first leg of that stool with five legs, the researcher leg. So everybody asked the question, can I? Everybody asked at some point early in their genealogical life, can I make a living in genealogy? And the easy answer is yes. But how? That's the really tougher question. And many professional genealogists are going to focus totally on their role of being a researcher. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Later, we'll talk about the other four legs. Personally, I think that if you just do research, you're going to be trapped in one-time revenue streams for the rest of your life. Don't misunderstand. You can make a living as a genealogist just by doing research. Generally, though, you're probably working for somebody else or you've got a whole bunch of other people working for you, one of the two. It could be that you're able to do repatriation research and you actually have a 40-hour-a-week gig as a genealogist. Or you might work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 40 hours as a government employee. But all those things take actually years of experience to get into. And then there's the issue of forensic genealogy, you may have the opportunity to do that and eventually work for a lawyer. Probably not a 40-hour-a-week gig. So let's talk about that first leg, that research leg. Could look like this, or it could look like this. Yours may be different. Remember that what I'm talking about today, for everyone, is different. You have to come to your own idea about how you are going to be as a genealogist. Now, there are some guidelines that we need to go over. So what are the traits of a person who's a researcher alone? They live in a world of short-term revenue. They have to be constantly working. They live for their repeat business, if there is any. And they suffer from the need for customer delight all the time. Ten good customers are great. One bad customer is terrible. The question you're going to have to ask yourself as a researcher is how do people know you? Who knows you? How are people going to find you? Those are the kinds of questions that you need to have answered pretty much before you start. Because if you don't have clients knocking at your door, how are you going to live? What are you known for? Me? I'm known for military. Me? I'm known for Quakers. I'm known for publishing. I'm known for problem solving, but it took a long time to get to that point. My first year of professional research, I focused totally on Navy. Do you know how many clients I had in one year? I had one, and it was a contemporary thing. It wasn't even an old Navy thing. It was a modern Navy thing, totally outside of my bailiwick. It took like 20 minutes to solve, and that's, all, that's the only client I had for an entire year. So I had to change things up. And you, too, might have to change things up in order to make a living at genealogy. There are some things that you have to have and you have to understand. You must, and I repeat must, own a copy of either Evidence Explained or Evidence. One or the other. I don't really care which, but eventually you're going to buy Evidence Explained. It's a guideline. It will help you. It will guide you down the path of citation. You cannot be a genealogist if you do not understand citation. Now, recognize that citation is a function of who you are writing for. If you're writing for a journal, they have a style sheet. They decide what kind of citation they want. If you're writing for your BCG portfolio, they decide what kind of citation they want. So the issue becomes you have to understand how to cite, what the basic elements of citation are. We're not going to cover this today. Get these books. Pay attention especially to the first two chapters. Those are probably the most two important pieces of writing in genealogy today or ever. If you don't own these books, you can't be a genealogist unless you own one of these two books. So what are the basics? The basics are, once you got this citation thing down, do you understand 
the evidence analysis process map? Have you ever even seen it? I'm not going to put it up. Your job, your homework, is to go find a copy of the evidence analysis process map and analyze it. Take a look at it. Look at what it tells you about sources, documents, books, artifacts, websites, databases, where everything comes from. Know how to define what's original, what's derivative, what's authored. Sources provide us with information. Some people think that people are sources. They are not. People lie. And it's okay for people to lie because that's their way of doing things, I guess. But you need to write it down. The interview is the source, not the people themselves. People saying something in a book, that's a source, but the book is the source. People telling you something doesn't count unless you document it, unless you write it down. It must be written down. And I don't mean in your report. I mean separate from your report. The information that you obtain, you have to address the issue of how involved is the informant? Were they present? Are they recalling something from 40 years ago? Are they basically providing you with hearsay? So we have primary, we have secondary, and have we just don't know. And from all of this, we select what evidence that we are, in fact, going to use because it relates to the question at hand. Because after all, you must have started this whole entire process with a question. A very delimited question. Not a broad question, but a delimited question that makes that question unique to any other question there ever was. Now, in answering that question, you're going to use evidence and you have to decide what evidence is direct, what evidence is indirect, and you also have to identify that evidence which was negative. In other words, you didn't find what you were looking for. Again, it doesn't count until you write it down. All of this leads to proof, and at this point you may or may not have an understanding of proof. In order to understand proof, you have to understand the genealogical proof standard. And I'm not going to go over the genealogical proof standard today either. But your homework assignment is to go and get a copy of genealogy standards. I don't care whether you get the second edition, the second edition revised, whatever edition you get, and study it and learn about the genealogical proof standard. We, at some point in the future, We'll talk about the genealogical proof standard, and we will also talk about genealogy standards. They are integral to being a genealogist. Understanding the standards is very important to being a genealogist. Part of that genealogical proof standard is that you have to write it down. So report writing, you can't be a researcher without report writing. And the only way you're going to get good at report writing is from practice, practice, practice. It doesn't count if you don't write it down. Go find other people's reports. Go look at samples of reports. Create reports. One of the things that I do is when I actually am able to work on my own family, I create the question, I do the research, I write a report. I treat myself as a client. That is another way to practice, practice, practice. The only way you will get good at report writing is through practice. I would recommend that if you're just starting out in report writing, that you, surely you have genealogical friends, that you have them look at your reports and see if they do a little peer review work. We'll at some point get to the point where we start talking about report writing. I'm just not there to talk about it yet. One of the things that you're going to have to establish as a researcher is your niche. Or are you really a generalist? Do you know how many generalists there are? Go out to the Association of Professional Genealogists website, to the directory, and wander through the names of people. Look at the ones you recognize, and then look at the ones that you don't recognize. The ones that you recognize probably have a niche, probably talk about a specific set of records in a specific time in a specific place, generally relating to a specific topic. 
the people you don't know tend to be all over the place. They research in 50 states. They research in every repository known to man. Well, I guess that's okay, but that doesn't create a niche. That creates a generalist. And personally, if I'm going to hire someone, I, want to, I don't want to hire a generalist. I want to hire a person who specializes in the records that I think will solve my problem. I may be wrong in regards to whether those records will solve my problem, but that niche person, that specialist, is probably going to know what records will solve my problem also. And if they're not capable of dealing with them, they'll know how to refer me. Now, there's also the issue, which I've already talked about, is your focus too narrow, the Navy example. So now when I do military, it's Army, Navy, Marine Corps. I don't do Coast Guard. So my focus militarily had to be spread out so it would reach most of the branches. The issue becomes, as a researcher, how will you become the go-to person for your niche? You want to be identified as the first or the second person that somebody thinks about when they have a problem that they can't solve, and are you the person that can solve it for them because of your expertise, your known expertise? In order to have expertise, you have to understand resources and what resources are available, whether they be county court records, vital statistics, land records, naturalizations, tax records, census records, probate, military, church or cemetery, everything that has to do with a place in a time. How have county records changed? How's the court system changed? When did vital statistics become a thing in, in your county, in your state? How have land records changed? Are you, in a, are you in a place where there are land patents as well as land deeds? When did naturalization stop in your county? And when did they move to federal records? That's a question most people know the answer to. Are there tax records and do you know how to use them? So the issue becomes one of understanding the resources that surround your topic. Now, recognize my topic is not a county. My topic is military, Quakers, problem solving, that kind of thing. But in order to do problem solving, I have to understand resources in general terms. You want to be, if you want to be a specialist in a county or in a state, you have to understand the resources of that county or state intimately. Now, one of the ways we do that is with a locality guide. Now, there are many locality guides now for states published by the National Genealogical Society as part of their research in the state series. But there are very few local locality guides, in other words, county level guides. There, there are a few of them around, and there, some of them are excellent examples of how to do a locality guide. And Heritage Books has some of those available. The issue is, for your own use and edification as a researcher in a county, shouldn't you create a locality guide for your county so that you, in one place, have all the information that you need at your fingertips in order to research in that county? And wouldn't it be nice if at some point in time you decided that you would publish that locality guide so that other people could benefit from your largesse and also that would help to establish you as the go-to person for that county, the person who wrote the locality guide for it. Be prepared to update the locality guide over time. So let's talk about the researcher piece. After all, research is the basic way that genealogists make money. You've got to know how much to charge. You've got to have a minimum fee. And I've already talked to you about the 2080 thing in regards to and multiplying the number of hours that you think you're going to have, uh, you're dividing it, you know, whatever number you come up with when you take the, those, those hours and evaluate them, multiply it times two, and that's probably what you should be charging. Should you charge for report time? Of course. Should you charge for analysis time? Of course. Are there types of client, clients or types of work that you will turn away? You should. You need to learn how to say no or you will be going down the rabbit hole and you won't be making any money because you'll be, you'll be spending those extra hours because you didn't think it was fair or you 
don't want to charge the client for learning, which you shouldn't be charging the client for learning. But if you accept work that you're going to have to learn, you got a problem because all of a sudden you have non-billable hours. So then comes the question of what do I do with my downtime? That is the most important time you have because that's time where you want to convert things into revenue streams. And we'll talk about that at a future session of becoming a professional genealogist. So this has been Craig with Just Genealogy. And today we've finished off the third Becoming a Professional Genealogist session. Our next session next Saturday will be on authoring, which is the second leg of our five-legged stool. And here we are again, converting people doing genealogy into genealogists day by day. I appreciate you. We're over 250 subscribers now. We're almost to 200 watched hours. Please tell your friends. Please subscribe if you haven't already. I appreciate all of you very much. If you have questions, please put them down in the comments. Love questions. Thank you so much.